is the second and final part of the Document Contract Postal Vessel Court Venue Mini Class. As I stated at the beginning of the first part, this is by no means comprehensive. I'm just going over general details of how it would be done to give you, the viewer, a sense of how you could possibly do this yourself. Of course, all of this hinges and is contingent upon your closure on the technology known as correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar. That is the most important thing, to know what it is you're doing, to have the authority to create something like this. You must have a claim of the live life in order to do something like this. A correct claim of the live life of which you are the authority of. You are the copyright copy claim holder of. One that you created and you authorized. Authority comes from knowledge. I say this over and over and over again. You have to know what it is you're doing. That's why I'm sharing this information and that's also why I'm not really getting into too many detailed specifics of it. Just sort of the generalities that are publicly available. If you search elsewhere, you will find the same information in different areas. I've just collected it together in one convenient location for you, the viewer. It's my gift to you. So this portion covers the syntax part of the document where you go into the quote unquote derelict vessel, the trespassers paperwork, you commandeer it, and you give closure to the syntax values within that document. You bank them as a bank banker, you bank numerical values into the word vessels that they have provided because they didn't provide any closure to you. They didn't give you a dictionary. You don't know what's being said on that document and there's modification all over it. And this is how you prove that. This is your continuance of the evidence. This is why you're telling them that Either they need to present a quo rento of their own showing their authority to do what they're doing, incorrect sentence structure, of course, or show a correct sentence structure contract that exists with the joinder of you and them, you being your live life claim autograph on a document contract post of vessel court venue on a contract with them that they've used an autograph as a live life claimant as well, and that there's a correct contract, a true bill, or however you want to say it. Of course, there isn't one, because that's the only way they would have authority to do anything in a contractual domain with you, the live life claimant, because that's you as the living man or woman, live man or woman. And then, of course, the third option that you give them is to go on vacation, to vacate, because of the fraud that you've shown. Because if they participate with it, now they're going to admit to fraud. So that's how it works. And that's what this part of it is about. And also at the end, I go into some postal mechanics, some very general postal mechanics. And actually, I do get pretty specific about walking into the post office and what you can do, some what your options are uh, when dealing with, you know, the postal clerks and things like that in the postal stations. How you carry yourself what postal mechanics you would use as a banker, as a whatever other title that uh, you choose to uh, incorporate. So that's about it. I hope you enjoy this and I look forward to your feedback. If of course you want to learn this stuff in detail, if you want to know how to do these things, cross all your T's and dot all your I's, contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen and apply for a correct grammar workshop or for a correct grammar test. Because first and foremost, the grammar is what's important. And I have to know that you have a certain level of knowledge and closure on the grammar before I will help you with any of these documents. And that's just because of safety reasons for the ages of the vessel, A-E-G-I-S. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the following presentation. So what we're looking at here is a letter from... Department of Treasury Internal Revenue Service, whatever that is. First off, let's put a couple stickers on here. 
so that they know what it is I'm doing. Put a nice little syntax key on there. And of course, nice little flag there. Courtesy of my buddy Cole and Josh. Thank you, Josh. And let's get down to business here. I have officially commandeered the vessel because it has no closure as to what these words are, what they mean. There's a lot of things on here that uh, don't make any sense. So I'm going to do a brief uh, forensics here. Hopefully you can read it. So I have this part up here, Department of the Treasury, Internal Revenue Service, Philadelphia, PA, and then some numbers there. And then we have a nice little cartoon here. Then we have some lines, notice, LT11, notice date, taxpayer ID, case reference number, to contact us, page 105. I'm only going to be using two pages for this particular example. And then this is where the taxpayer name would be, address, city, state, zip. Notice of intent to levy and notice of your right to a hearing. Now, do you notice something here, ladies and gentlemen? Notice of intent to levy and notice of your right to a hearing. It sort of sounds a little bit uh, quasi-quantum grammar-ish, doesn't it? Well, let's get some, uh, you know, a few of the easiest things out of the way first. Uh, just syntaxing some, some things here. We have the... Dangling participle verb, adverb, 3, 4, 1, 2, and of course a 3, 3, 4, Internal Revenue Service, Philadelphia is a standalone pronoun, PA, is an adjective, 19255-0010 is a pronoun, taxpayer name, address, city, State zip, that's just basically a tangible contract uh, pronouns and adjectives. Notice of intent to levy and notice of your right to a hearing. So that's pronoun, adverb, verb, adverb, future tense, verb, conjunction, adjective, pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun, future tense, adverb, dangling participle verb. And the reason why I'm using this as a dangling participle verb and also for treasury up here is because there's a break in the continuance of the evidence there. We, the spacing has not been given closure to just like everything else on the document has not been given closure to. So therefore, I am giving the closure to prevent any shipwrecks that may occur because of this negligence and lack of closure. Intent to seize your property or rights to property. Amount due immediately. And then we have a number here. So the number is a standalone pronoun. Immediately is a non-tangible contract pronoun. Due is an adjective. Amount is an adjective. Because this is one entire entity, that stops there. And now we go into intent to seize your property or rights to property. 
that's a dangling participle verb property too is a future tense adverb. So now we have rights as a verb or as a conjunction, property is a verb, your is an adverb, sees is a verb, to is an adverb, future tense, intent is standalone pronoun because nothing can follow a pronoun except for an adverb or a break in the continuance of the evidence. In this case, it's the former. So now we have, we haven't received a payment despite sending you several notices about your overdue taxes. Now, you would go through and syntax this as well. Now, I will point out that, ladies and gentlemen, I have done something like this. A couple years ago I did before, um, actually, <laughs> just to be blunt, before I really knew what I was doing. And I didn't syntax the whole thing, but I did syntax some of it. And I wrote a correct sentence structure claim, much like you saw in the first, uh, first part of this series. And they sent me back a settlement letter saying, we're done, we're square. So that's how I knew back in 2017, that's how I knew that this worked. So you would do that, and then you would also, you know, maybe do some things down here. As you notice, this is in a box. What's going on here? This is a fear-mongering tactic by my perception. Amount due immediately, same thing here, amount due immediately. What you need to do immediately, pay immediately, send the amount due, or we may seize, may seize. Doesn't say they're going to do it, it says they may seize the property. If you can't pay, pay as much as you can and make payment arrangements. So ladies and gentlemen, they just want their money. Right to request a collection due process hearing. If you wish to appeal this proposed levy action, complete and mail the enclosed form. Request for collection due process or equivalent hearing. Send the form to us at the address listed at the top of page one. Be sure to include the reason you're requesting a hearing, as well as other information requested by form. If you don't file form by April 1st, you will lose the ability to contest appeals decision in U.S. Task Court. Now, ladies and gentlemen, keep in mind that this is their court. By having this letter and participating with it in the fiction, you have consented to be a part of what it is they're doing. If you take this, And syntax it, as I started to do, but I didn't finish. Syntax it. Um, let's see what else. I don't see any italics or anything on here. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do little things like, like what, what the hell's that, you know? Just little goofy things you can do. If you choose to use uh, U.S. codes or... Or things like that like you know title this or title that you can do that but you have to make sure that you have those things translated in a correct sentence structure communication policy syntax grammar before you put them on your document and you must understand what they are you have to have closure on it so this is two pages add this on to the other two pages there would also be a syntax key along with this And a syntax key would look something like this. Um, it would be in color. But I would tack this on after this. So now that makes our, our document up to five pages. So this would be three of five, uh, four of five, and five of five. Now... It's up to you if you want to do this or not do this. If you would like, 
You can put a stamp here. And you can autograph over that stamp if you want on the last page. Or you can do it. on the back of the first page. It's up to you. So let's fix this. This is one of five. Two of five. Three of five. Four of five. And five of five. Thumbprint it. There would be a stamp there. And I like to use some pretty blue ribbon. Tie it into a nice bow for them. On top of that, I'll take some glue and glue it together to bond it. So now I have some nice maritime ribbon and some glue. And there's my document contract postal vessel court venue. Now what happens? Well, let's find out what happens. So that about wraps it up for this mini class. If you thought I was kidding, I'm not. This theoretically is what my document contract postal vessel court venue would look like. The pretty little maritime ribbon on it. Again, I would put glue up here in the corner to bond all of this together. And I've chosen to put my authorization on the back page as well. There would be a postage stamp here as well as a thumbprint. Or if you choose, as I said before, you can put it on the back side of your cover page up here if you want to. And then we have the evidence here, which you would syntax the entire thing if you so choose. As you notice up here, I use the word proof and put the word evidence in brackets. Both of those could be considered no contract words. However, <clears throat> proof is a little less uh, no contract than, than evidence is. I know that's either no contract or it isn't. But when you look up proof, you will see uh, that the PRO actually comes from P-E-R, which means utterly and thoroughly. And then the, <clears throat> the O of, basically when you think of the positional O of in correct sentence structure, it means concern. It serves the function of concern. So proof basically means to be concerned with thoroughly and utterly having something. So proof, thoroughly and utterly having the facts or facts of whatever you, it is you're conveying. It also can be construed as test, as a test, as you will find out if you parse the word proof. So now what you would do, of course, you would have all of this stuff on file, all right? All of this on file. You would have copies of this. Matter of fact, you can keep the original and put it in a, a plastic uh, sheath and keep it for your own records, or you can send the original to them and you keep a copy, however you want to do it, and then you would put it in one of these. So now you have one of these, you can seal it, 
what I like to do, I like to put, you know, whatever little stamps you have. You can stamp it just like the post office stamps it. You can use wax seal if you want to. If you have a favorite volition claim number or whatever type of stamps you have, confidential, whatever, domestic, commercial, however, you know, whatever you want to choose to use, whatever you're conveying, you have to have knowledge of what it is you're conveying. You have to know what you're doing. I say this over and over and over again, but I can't really stress it enough. So you have your envelope here. So let me get my bearings because this is all backwards. So your correct address would go up here and then you would put the correct correct sentence structure address of the individual or contract party you're sending it to which would be on that paper you would put it that uh, address here um, in correct sentence structure and if you don't know how to write a correct sentence structure address I urge you to look at my correct sentence structure playlist there are several videos in there which show you exactly how to do that. Now again, uh, it's handy to have stamps. I have this with my correct address that I punch in the corner there. Now, if you choose, you can put a $1 stamp or any denomination of stamp that you want up here, as long as it's a whole number, and autograph over it. It's not necessary, but you can do it. And then you can carry that to the post office. And the purpose of that, it well, there's several purposes to doing that. The first would be, it's your fee for freight. You are now letter carrying postmaster of this vessel, and you're carrying it from this location down to the postal station. Okay? When you get there, and you hand them this, and this stamp has an autograph over it, they are probably going to question you on it. Not all the time, but they may. Like for me, the first time I did it, uh, the postal clerk said, you're not supposed to write over that stamp. They don't like that. And I very calmly told her, oh, oh yes, it's very necessary that I do that uh, because I'm authorizing the transshipment of this vessel from my hands as postmaster and letter carrier to you, a custom clearinghouse broker, to push it, push it through your custom clearinghouse. Coming into contract with you. I paid for the stamp. It's fee for freight. It's mine. I autographed over it. I canceled it. And and I put my CPAS C treaty number under that. I said this number is the same number that's on my CPAS C treaty, which is a federal contract for the closure of my correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar contracts and when i started talking about that her eyes glazed over and she just went about her business and did what uh, i wanted her to do now if you send this registered you're going to need this type of thick uh shipping tape And what you have to do with that shipping tape is take it and seal up any edges or corners or creases that you see on the back. Don't let it hang over. Don't let it wrap around to the front. Just seal it up. Like one here, one down the center, and then, of course, uh, one across the bottom because, as you see, there's a crease here. So you're going to need that. You come in and it's all ready to go for them. Because if you don't do that, if you go into a very nice and kind postal station, they will do it for you. But sometimes you can come into a postal station where they're like, uh-uh, we can't do this. This has to be sealed up. You have to, you know, you have to have it ready when you go in there. So if you go in there fully prepared, they know that you know what you're doing. They know that you you're coming in correct. And you're serious. So that's what I do. I put the tape on. It's all packaged up, ready to go with my stamps and their authorizations on it and everything. And it's and it's ready to go. You know, I send it out how I want them to send it out. I tell them what to do. As postmaster, I tell them what to do. And when I say postmaster, I mean postmaster of this vessel. 
nothing else, just of this vessel, and of course of myself. I don't claim postmaster of anyone else or any other venue. Uh, so let me see if I covered everything. Let's see, we did the correct sentence structure part of it. We did the syntaxing part of it. I covered briefly some general postal mechanics, uh, some flag mechanics, and I think that's about it. And banking. The banking was taken care of when we did the syntax. It would also be a good idea to study laws of salvage. All right? Because that's basically what you're doing. You're towing that evidence as a salvage because it's derelict. All right? And, of course, if you want to put in your uh, live life claim number in here. Did I say that in the first thing? Yeah, I put in live life claim in at the bottom here. Uh, you can put your live life claim number in there if you want to. Now, people ask me, should I include a copy of my live life claim? That is entirely up to you, however you feel you want to navigate. I personally don't. Um, if they would actually come back on me and ask me for it, of course I would provide it to them. But I've never had anyone ask me that. No one. And I've been 100% successful with every single one of these that I've created. And what you've done also there, ladies and gentlemen, once you send this out through the postal station, through the custom clearinghouse, you have created a federal postal court. Those words, federal postal court. It's a good idea to look those things up and know what they mean, especially the word federal. If you don't feel comfortable using that word, you don't have to. But it's good to have closure on it. You've basically created your own postal court. I know this because I've done it multiple times over the last five years, and it works. It just does. I've been 100% successful with it. Some cases took a little more effort and sweat equity than others. Some of them had me sweating, but it all worked out. And this stuff really works if you know what you're doing. And the key to that, ladies and gentlemen, the key to having this stuff work, the key to being successful with this is to know the grammar. <laughs> I can't reiterate that enough. And people, I don't know. Some people just think it's just a easy, quick, silver bullet type thing. That's not what it is at all. You have to know what you're doing. You have to put the time and the energy into it. You have to go, you know, sometimes you got to get in the trenches and, uh, and work it out. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn this grammar, contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen. And you can apply for a correct grammar workshop. You can also apply for memberships on my YouTube channel. Just click the join button for more information. Or study the over 400 videos that I've invested thousands of hours in creating as my gift to you, the public. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.